and it is PowerWorks with Glenn Power from PowerWorks Automotive. Well, we're going to fix cars. We're going to talk about people's car problems, and the list goes on. That's where we're going. <laughs> the, the, the former, not so much, fixing cars. <laughs> Man, can you not get parts these days? I, you know, this is a big issue, isn't it? Parts, and it's it's a global issue, but good luck. Good yeah. luck. Where we are now, obviously, people, that like, all the parts, of, although the law's been passed, hasn't it, for, for sale of foreign goods no longer being able to be monopolized. Right. But we'll see how that's implemented. People that monopolize it are very, very powerful, however, and yeah. also in, in good good uh, standing, of course, with, with their supplier. So yeah. it's difficult to see that changing anytime soon. But th these people, as powerful as they may be, they had a lot more to lose during COVID yeah. and they've lost it and they felt it and they've trimmed. And one of the things they've trimmed is manpower and, and sometimes space. Mm -hmm. Rented space. So, well, in, in buying a whole bunch of inventory, if I'm going to buy brake pads and I'm going to buy, so that's the point. They have motors. to pay for it before it arrives. Yeah. So they 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 don't necessarily want to speculate on parts on the shelf. No. I'm going to have one or two. <sighs> Good luck if your car breaks and you need something that's fairly in demand and oh, we yeah. can't get it here. And then or yeah, okay, we can get it. We're going to air freight it. I sent an email to a guy in the UK. We've got an AC Cobra kit in the in the garage. Um, it's done 102 miles and the clutch has been eaten by the engine already. 102 miles? Yeah. Oh. So it's a kit car built yeah. um, from a company in the UK. Those are beautiful looking. So they put the kit together on a Jaguar E-Type chassis. Okay. And then someone else has assembled it and then it's either not been done right or it's been misused. Of course it has, isn't it? You know. <laughs> yeah. But um, the clutch is completely destroyed. But it's been sat, it's done 102 miles and it was built seven years ago okay. it's been sat a lot so it's not great but um anyway to the point of i sent an email to who i was told supplied the clutch for this kit saying can you help me i've got this vehicle sent them the chassis number with the people that supplied the kit and everything else nice well thought out email i don't like sending them at the best of times uh -huh. got a reply very quickly got a reply within a couple of hours. The reply was possibly. <laughs> possibly. One word. <laughs> possibly. That's it. <sighs> what? what? Do, do you, you want the business or not? <laughs> yeah. You know? If, if it's on a chassis of an E-Class. There's only e E-Type Jaguar chassis. Does it not use any of the parts? No, no. Oh. It's a V8 out of a Ford. Oh, okay. So we've, we've narrowed down what we need now. Uh, with a different company. However, their listing lists as an 11 and a half inch diameter and the one we've got is 11 inches. So mm -hmm. I've asked them a question now as to whether or not that's going to fit. And, yeah. you know, if it's just a, a, a listing error, a misprint or yeah. typo on their website or if I've got something weird and wonderful and if so, can they help me? So, all good fun. <laughs> but it's just that, you know, we, we had 28 cars in Alcoos as of 8 o'clock this morning when... Me and DJ went through the work. And That's a lot of cars. 14 of them were stood still waiting for parts. And, you know, that's, I think that is something that me as the customer forgets that, okay, yeah, I got to bring it in, but we got to get the parts, got to find the parts. Yeah. And that means that there's a whole bunch of stock just sitting around and there's nothing to do to speed it up. Yeah, so it's, it's difficult. I mean, one of those vehicles is the Cobra, which is on a, on a lift because we've got yeah. a gearbox out of it. We can't necessarily do anything to speed that up because we haven't even found out for sure that we can get it. Yeah. It's listed on a website for £25, but it's not the right size. So I don't know. We're, 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 having, a, we're having a right time of it at the minute. And I'm sure everyone else in the trade is. I don't think it's just us. Yeah. And more, you know, this is the good luck of buying new cars. I see them advertised. I see them advertised. I see a, an occasional new car. Mm. I don't see anyone. I don't really see a lot of movement. Deliveries that were for this month have been pushed back to next month. And, you know, showrooms are full of used cars rather than new cars. It's got to, I, I mean, I feel for these guys. I really do feel for an industry that's been turned on its head. And, you know, it's, it's tough. It's really tough. Yeah. Although I did see something interesting on the road and I haven't looked, I didn't even put it in the notes. And so we're not really going to talk about it except to just have a, a by the way. Toyota Corolla 
Do you remember that lovely yet hideous? I, I thought it was lovely. Many people thought it was hideous. The Honda Civic Cross, whatever it was called. Cross, oh yeah, Cross Tour. That's it, the Cross Tour. I mean, that was a Honda Accord Cross Tour, the Cross Tour. So whoever was working at Honda with the Cross Tour clearly now works at Toyota, and they have taken a Corolla and they've called it a crossover whatever, and it is literally a mini Cross Tour. Oh no! <laughs> I know. I, I was beside. I was going. What's wrong with these people? I was going. Wow, because it is. A, it, it's branded Corolla, but it is. This mini SUV now. What's wrong with the guys over in Japan? <laughs> I don't know. They did that. There's the the because um, Pete drives one. Pete from Borgenbeck, the Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross. Is, are they nice? I've seen. No. I've seen them. No. <laughs> they, they, They've got like an extra window just yeah, underneath yeah, the yeah, back yeah, window yeah, to make yeah. them somehow that makes them a crossover. <laughs> It's a crossover between a car and a greenhouse. I don't know what the extra glass makes it a crossover of. I always think, how, what happens if that glass breaks? Who's changing that and where do you get it? It's like you Price don't... of steel's gone up. Apparently. So they, like, they, they jack the whole car up and they're like, oh, we've got some space here. We can't fill it with steel. That's too expensive. Let's we'll put glass in. Put some glass. Crazy. So I thought this Toyota, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look it up, see if I can't go on and get a look at one, and then we'll have a chat about it. Mm. But oh, I'm curious who's buying it. And you know, well, well, where it's made, it just looked weird. I mean, it, it, weird and wonderful. Does it, what gap in the market does that fill? I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna look it all up, and and it's weird and wonderful all at the same time. So, well, if that's not a hook for people to stay listening to the upcoming episode, there we go. That's, that's our next one. We're gonna talk about this crazy thing. Here, here's another good one. And I, every day, I go and walk my dog. Yeah. And every day I pass by a, a household Emirati boys. No, they're Marty because I've seen them out and we've had a chat and they're 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 Marty guys. Fortunately, they don't speak a whole bunch of English and they're they're rather annoyed that I don't speak a whole bunch of Arabic. But where we found <laughs> a middle ground, we yeah. managed to manage. And they've got one of them drives the the LS 450 Lexus, but the model of Lexus that that you want to have, you know, you know which one I'm talking about. The you know, 2012 start to round them off on the front and back, and yeah, yeah. And so one of them's driving one of these. He's got he's got the suspension lowered a little bit. It's got low profile tires on it. I'm thinking it's 2012. Okay. There's a little bit of underbody lighting. Plastic on the seats. Still. It's got carpeting on the dash. And all the windows still have the delivery stickers intact and the blue door things. But I'm thinking it's 2012 year model. So it's 10 years old. <laughs> They've kept the delivery stickers Everything. on it. Everything. They've kept all pristine, the pristine protection delivery. stuff on it, which yeah. in the UK we'd have been stung for for quality on delivery as being poor. Yeah. And then lowered it and put neons on it. Yep. And I, I, I drove by the other day and they were both in it. They were just sitting in front of the house listening to the stereo in it. And I'm just going, this is classic. So I, I pull up and I say, I'm gonna, I gotta, we got to make it a plan in the next coming weeks that I'm going to bring over the recorder and I'll mic you guys up just tell me why you love your car. <laughs> and, and they both looked at me and the ones guys talk to my brother because I don't understand a word you're saying. And I spoke to him who got like three quarters of what I said. And he says, okay, yeah, for sure. I said, I just want to know why you love your car. There's no, no hidden agenda here. I just want to put it on the podcast. Why you love your car. And, I, and that got me thinking because I know there's a guy who who will ask he, he goes around when at stop signs or whatever and has people roll down. You know, what, what do you do for a living? Yeah, yeah. I just I just thought people who love their cars tell us why because I, I thought it would be fun. So we'll get a, a few minutes, but it's it's that classic thing because I'm looking at the car and I would have taken all that stuff off, especially the passenger side front window with the sticker on it. Like that's a it's an obstruction. <laughs> well, it is. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> but you see it a lot, right? Yeah. Here, people just take the delivery of the vehicle literally as it came off the ship, and then mm -hmm. it stays like that yeah. until they sell it. So it's, uh, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, well, you know, each to their own, yeah. but I don't see the benefit <laughs> of keeping all the original <laughs> delivery stuff on it and then lowering it. Yeah, and it, and it looks to me like they've had some paint work done on the side because there's, it's the, not well, probably because they can't see out the windows because yeah. the stickers on there. Yeah, the, the other one yesterday went and got, as we were talking about, went and got the the Wrangler, you know, 2008 year model, passed RTA once again. So I always do a little cheer. 
And it, the, the little things that are getting funny with RTA. So I do remember, and, and I, I mean, things have only gotten better. I remember when I, uh, I had a uh, Hyundai Galloper. And second year I owned that thing, I needed, you know. Fail. Get, well, getting, uh, it did fail. And it <laughs> failed because I had, a, I had a roof rack put onto it. And it failed. And, and getting my RTA inspection back in that day was a three-hour job somewhere on the border of Charger. Yeah. Whereas now it's, it's much quicker. But they, they failed it because they said, you got to take that roof rack off. And so, you know, my wife actually had gone to do it. She said, hold on, so we got to take the roof rack off. Yeah, you got to take it off. But I, I'm going to take it off at home. Then I'm going to take it home and put it back on. She goes, I just have to have that roof rack off when I do the thing. I was like, okay. So, it, it, but it was interesting. So we, we passed again to this time, the Wrangler. And underneath my vehicle, you know, there's that charcoal filter for yeah. whatever. That the, the bracket has, for whatever reason, doesn't hold it in place. <laughs> so I, in, instead of using wire or whatever, or maybe just taking a hammer and hitting the bracket up a little bit because it's just a piece of metal that you, you know, probably yeah. that's all I have to do. No, I've tied it in place with climbing cord that's like red. And I always think, you know, I'm, I'm shooting myself in the foot here, but I'm thinking when you put the car up on the hoist and you're looking underneath the flashlight, shouldn't that be a red flag that the car is being held together by rope and duct tape on the back? It should. <laughs> when, when we used to get cars in the UK for MOT, yeah. obviously in the UK it's very difficult to keep a car clean because it's yeah. always raining. Right. It's very, very difficult to keep a car clean. So sometimes you get them in and the, and the spray off the road would cover the rear number plate and you can't even read right. the number plate on it. And it was a bit of a grey area as to whether we were allowed to wipe that for the test or whether we should fail and refuse to test it. Oh, that's pedantic. So we always, of course, we used to clean them. So what we would then do is we would wash the cars. Okay, yeah. we'll wash the cars before the test. But the guy that was um, my mentor when I first started as an apprentice said to me, look, if a car comes in, it's dirty outside, but the car is clean when it arrives, they're either hiding something or they really care about it. He said, so then we'll get into the car and if inside the car is clean, they're still hiding something or they're really into it. So then what we're going to do is we're going to look under the car. Before we get to the bottom, we're going to see what the tyres are on it. If it's got good tyres on it, they love the car, it'll pass. If it's got bad tyres on it, they were hiding something, I guarantee it will fail. And 100 times out of 100, <laughs> his theory was right. So what we always do here is we say to the customers, look, if you're going for your test, if it's in with us for a service, obviously we didn't realize the timing with yours, we could have done it, but we'll say to them, look, if it's in for a service with us, then we'll take it for test so you don't have to go anywhere when you get it back. Like you say, it's a lot easier to do now, but it's still an hour out of your day. Yeah. So if the customer says, no, no, I'll take it, I like to take it, whatever, we'll say to them, okay, well, you know, these are little bits that they might fail on and it might pass, we're not sure. By the letter of the law, it probably should fail on this, but again, it's difficult to inspect and see so you might pass, et cetera. Take your car, make sure it's clean when it goes there. Make sure your car is clean and presentable because when it gets there dirty, here, there's no excuse. Yeah, It's not like it's raining all the time. A bit of dust is a bit of dust. I was outside clean, the testing center, there was a car wash guy going up the line of cars to get things. You want your car washed? It's like, <laughs> so the real thing here, if yeah. you take your car to the car for the test and it's clean, it's obvious that you care for your car. Yeah or appears to be. And, and if you get there dirty and it's dusty and you can see where you've had the wiper on because you've just driven it off the drive for the last 365 <laughs> days to work and back, they're going to take a, a deeper, harder look at it. Yeah. And I don't see anything wrong with that, but it does mean that sometimes little bits get missed. Yeah. And that's just human error. There's always going to be a, a, an element of it. I, I don't see how at this point in time AI could ever replace a human inspecting a vehicle. Very difficult to understand how they would do that. Um, I'm sure we'll get there. But at this moment in time, it's always gonna be a human, so there'll always be human error. But if you, can, if you take your car in that you look after, have a chat with the guy that's testing it, talk to them, you know, go over a few things. Oh, you know, it's, like for your car, you've owned it from, you're the only owner of that car. Yeah. It's 14 years old, like that's not common here. So those kind of things. And being a Wrangler, it's the same for anything. We have 
a lot of classics come in. When you get a classic car, they tend to get an easier ride because mm. the tester, oh, it's new to them. They, they're interested to talk about the car. So they kind of get an easier ride than your everyday run of the mill cars because they are just mm, another one, let's test it. And they know what the common failure points are as well. The, the car in front of me got failed for tires. Yeah. And he had three tires that were of proper age, but one, and I, I was watching the guy because you know, you got to stand back because there's cameras. and. You know, so I was just watching because it's outdoors. And he was going around and he was checking the dates and then he went to the next tire and went to the next tire and then he goes back to the front tire and he's checking the date and he, I see him sitting there looking. So old he can't believe it. Yeah, he, and he's, he's looking and, 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 I, and it, the, the telltale that there was a problem was when he adjusted his glasses and he's looking again. <laughs> and then he goes back to the, the tire in the back of the car and he's going, he goes back and he's going, yeah, sorry, tires. Yeah. yeah. So five years outright fail doesn't matter if the tires have never been fitted and you've literally fitted them that morning five years and it's an outright fail and rightly so in this mm. country definitely um, I, mean, I thought four or three i thought three might three you're give. pushing it and to be fair when it's yeah. at three years old if there's the slightest issue on that tire if it looks like you've brushed a curb or there's yeah. a bit of crack between the treads they'll fail it because mm. you can't take a chance yeah to talk about the the other thing that i saw yesterday which i i i'm just trying to figure out what what they were doing is someone was there with a Nice, no, a Land Cruiser, modified, clearly modified. And as he was pulling into the spot, he was far enough away that you could, you know, he got the window down, he was, he was a cool dude. And I noticed as he's pulling in, because you, you could hear it, so obviously that's not stock, that anything in that machine was stock. And there was a chain underneath the rear axle so I don't know where it was bolted to, because but it was you know like a big heavy chain that was connected between both axles, kind of hanging down a bit. And I'm going, what is he using that for? And I thought maybe he's for pulling people out of sand that you just hook something onto this chain, but it was at the rear axles going across, hanging down. Well, across the width of the car. Yeah, yeah. Might be a secondary support for the diff. I don't know. Well, out. Maybe I thought that was just weird. Yeah, <laughs> you see some weird mods here. Some, some weird mods. We, we were out in uh, we were out in the desert just by just off of the Labab Road. Okay. We just went out into the desert on Saturday, just barbecue. Yeah. And me and the family and DJ and we met some friends. They were camping, and uh, we just uh, DJ couldn't get his Camaro in, obviously. <laughs> yeah. So he took, took, we got to the meeting point. DJ drove one of our friends um, Dune Buggy in. He drove his Armada in and the other one was an LR3. And I drove the Touareg in. No problem for the Touareg. In fact, never was I worried about it, but I didn't even let the tire pressures down or anything. Nice. Just okay. kept it going. It was in. It was great. And then we were quite far in, probably about eight kilometers. Oh, yeah, that's serious. All, all in all. Some rough stuff and... The, the, the Armada bottomed out on everything because it's right. like four miles long <laughs> and heavy, really heavy. So that wasn't great, but we managed to get it out. But uh, the, the dunes that we were on, we're, like I say, we're not, we're not talking Lee were yeah, but the, 200 foot dunes, but we're, it, it was decent. At that point, it doesn't matter. If you're not accustomed to dunes, whether they're giant or whether they're small, if you're not but, accustomed to driving in them, you're done for. There was a group of people that came out thinking they were on Mars or something, right. like NASA-grade mods to the trucks, <laughs> spitting raw fuel out the exhaust. Oh, no, no. 18 turbos on the V8 and 17 feet <laughs> height lifts, yeah. bumpers, everything like, just looking at them thinking, What are you doing? You have more fun than you driving ours, isn't it? Didn't even put it in off-road mode. Just drove it in steadily, kept my momentum and yeah. kept going. And you know, these modifications on some of them are so ridiculous. And, but the worst part of it is, it's not like they get them back and put them on a trailer. No. Drive them on the road. Yeah, yeah. With the tires going. <laughs> no, I always think the vibration. So Three they, miles to a gallon. Well, I, I remember going with him to Sean in his Wrangler when he owned it, which he, which he still to this day says that was his favorite car. And and he had some nice mods done to his, of course, and it it had a little bit of wheel vibration just from the from the treads, and it's like, you know, it's nice. But with the Wrangler, because you got the big 
couldn't so do that for a long when time. When you put the big wheels on them, they have a steering damper. Now you can upgrade the steering damper, but you can only go so far with it. Yeah. There's a there's a finite amount of space for that to go both lengthwise and um, the thickness of the actual damper itself, like the, the, the circumference and diameter of it. So the bigger the wheel and tire, the more load that is on that damper. And it's so hard to get rid of any of that vibration once you get there. It's, it's like uncomfortable to drive it. Mm. And it's not as though those big wheels and tires are absolutely necessary. They're not like deal breakers. You can still get on in the sand yeah, yeah. with normal road tires and sense yeah. and the right speed and yeah. the right pressure. You know, like, what are you going to do? I, we, we, we'd once been out in the Pajero and got it stuck because Pajeros are gutless, terrible things. <laughs> but I once, see lots of people out in Pajeros, LR3s and LO4s. I've seen those things get yeah, stuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I always thought. They're just should, so heavy. They I shouldn't mean, be getting stuck. Part, right? part of it is driver error, I think. Yeah. But they are very heavy. But the, the Pajero was a shocking car. We all know. I don't you, like do you it. still own the Pajero? No. You no, no. got rid of it. It just didn't. The you Touareg know. is... Yeah, yeah. Touareg is a much better car in every single way. But we were out in that and it got stuck. So May, my oldest, whilst we're going on the way into the desert, in the Touareg, she's going, Daddy, we're not going to get stuck, are we? We're not going to sink, are we? I'm like, no, this car's better. It's got more power. And she's like, but my friend at school's got the same car as we used to have. And they said, that's made for the desert, but this car isn't made for the desert. I was like, right. <laughs> I'm going to show you. <laughs> so I couldn't get stuck at that point. I then explained to her where the name Tuareg came from. She seemed a bit more relaxed after that. Uh -huh. And we didn't get stuck. And we went in and then we had to come out and it was like nine o'clock at night. Yeah. So as we were coming out, we were watching the fireworks from Global Village. because We were going out in that direction and didn't get stuck in the dark either. So, in fact, the dune buggy got stuck twice and we never got stuck on the way out. So, wow. uh, yeah, really impressed with it and it was good. But no mods, yeah. 260,000 kilometers, 10 years old. Yeah. <laughs> good to go. Yeah. The, the, uh, when, when we start thinking about some of these crazy things, I want to go back to the, 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 the damper, the power steering damper. Joey Wu Wu was sharing a story with me about it. One of his buddies, and I think it's a rental actually. He had a, he had a rental Wrangler, nice. two liter turbo. And, and I'm thinking that sounds like a fun little ride. Don't know if it was short or long wheelbase. He didn't say, but he did say that the guy, and I'm, and I'm thinking this is a rental and you're having this problem. He did say the guy was having issues with the wobble of death mostly when he was hitting potholes and the thing would go into the death wobble, which, yeah. you know, it, 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 if you own a Wrangler, I've, I've never had that happen actually on my long wheelbase, only on the short wheelbase. And while it's terrifying, you know, it's, it's slow down. It's, it's yeah. essentially it's the, the anti-lock braking system kicking in because the, the wheel started to wobble and it thinks that it, it, That's what makes it worse. When yeah. the ABS kicks in and you start, you start to press the brake to panic, in your panic to slow down and think, oh, there's something wrong with the brakes because the yeah. pedal's vibrating back at you. Yeah. That's what makes that worse. But it's quite the, when the steering wheel's just going. <laughs> yeah, anyone that's driven a, a Wrangler for any sort of length of time has probably had that, yeah. you know, and then. And it's, and it's affectionately called the death wobble. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, this, the Discovery 2 Land Rovers, they had a similar setup. That mm -hmm. was terrible. So what, what's, what, but I thought a, a newer vehicle, they, this should not be happening. Like really. The As problem is with the design of the steering, they require a steering damper. Mm. There's no steering rack with a steering arm and a tire at end on the end of it. It's mm. a series of steering arms effectively, which is, basically going from a steering box the full width of the car okay. three times. So it's old school? Yeah. Like, yeah. that's really old school. Yeah, but it works. Yeah. It's just that you have this downside of it. Um, racks are very difficult in terms of cost of production. Steering boxes, it's just old fashioned big box of gears and oil and it yeah. works. Steering racks are a little bit more finely tuned and engineered. You know, it's just the way it is. Yeah. Just just how it's set up. But you know, the the, the Wrangler, the Discovery Two Defenders, 
you know, the, in fact, the defenders that had the and the earlier discoveries that had they, they have swivel housings <laughs> on the end of the <laughs> really um, differential tube, basically, which is like a ball and socket. So the hub is the socket, and the end of it is a ball, and then the whole hub moves around that. But you can not can you will over time that will become too loose like a hip joint I suppose yeah. so you have to adjust it with shims so we had a, a spring not dissimilar to the spring that you'd weigh a, a suitcase where you got an airplane yeah. or something like yeah. that and you can check the preload and if it's too slack then you'll put some shims in and tighten it up but on those where the damper goes starts to wobble and people are like oh, I know what it is, it's fine, I'll just be yeah. careful going over them and yeah. leave it for the service, leave it for the service. Yeah. But that extra movement at speed wears the free the preload on the <laughs> swivel, so then they start to go as well, and it's ridiculous, yeah. like terrifying, really, really difficult to control. I mean, at least on the Wrangler, you've got kind of a normal hub set up. Yeah. Normal being more modern, I say normal's not the right word, but it's... It is difficult to um, explain unless you've had it. Yeah. It's, it's literally like, and one of the terrible ones is you just go like round a clover leaf or something on a yeah. on the highway. You go over the drains yeah. or the joints that's exactly, and the tarmac. That's exactly how with a bit of lock on, that and then, it. then that's it. That's, you screwed. That for me was the trigger every time. Yeah, heading to the a studio. Yeah. Hit, hit the hit the seam and it would go right into it. And it so you know the, the the easy one was when you're going around that corner, just straighten up at that yeah. point. Didn't have a problem. But if I was turning left Slight every turn. time, yeah. every time, and you know you don't need that. No, <laughs> definitely not. Because I, like you say, the ABS kicks in. Yeah. it throws the speed sensors out. You press the brake to try and stop, and the brake pedal is rock hard because it thinks the brakes are locking up. Yeah. So you can't press the brake either. <laughs> no. so you're like, oh no! <laughs> it's, yeah, it was it was never fun. It, but I, it, you know, in retrospect, when I think back, the number of dampers I've gone through—not that it's a bad thing—but I've gone I've gone through many at this point. <laughs> so well, you think about steering dampers as opposed to suspension dampers. It just goes to show why size is an issue here, and because they're limited to the size of that steering. The suspension dampers and the steering dampers are working all the time. Yeah. But there's more load in terms of physical weight on the suspension than there is on the steering. Okay, it takes a lot of effort to turn it, and there's a lot of hydraulic and mechanical effort put through the steering box. To, sorry, through the steering by the steering box. But it's not as much as going up and down speed humps right. and stopping and starting, braking and accelerating. Yeah. But your suspension lasts a lot longer. And another example of that is, you know, we just mentioned the LR3s, LR4s, the air suspension on those, anyone that's owned one or looking to buy one that does any research online, a lot of people will say, especially in this part of the world, the air suspension's a bit of a weak point. But there are trucks out there <laughs> that carry 50-ton <laughs> payloads that have yeah. never had air springs fail. I worked at yeah. AAA when I first came here, and we had a fleet that had air suspension on. Yeah. Never failed. It's tried and true air suspension. Never ever failed, work. but they've got copious amounts of space the rubber can be yeah. 20 mil thick and the, you know there's a lot more space and the, yeah. the unions can be proper brass unions rather than push fit plastic. So the Land Rover's issue isn't necessarily that the system's not good, it's just that maybe the, the application, there's not enough space yeah. and that goes, that's what happens with the steering damper. And then you know if you were to put too big of a steering damper on there, you lose ground clearance, you're gonna lose steering ability, it's gonna become very difficult to steer it's gonna shock the steering wheel straight every single time. It's gonna be very hard to control the vehicle, so they're limited. And it's kind of a fix to a problem they didn't necessarily anticipate. Yeah. So it's one of those sort of, it's, it's been with us for decades and it's not going anywhere necessarily right away, but it's just one of those problems that occurred because we didn't know when we first designed it, how that was gonna happen. And then, oh, we'll put a damper on that to stop that. Yeah. Imagine driving the first car that didn't no. have the damper on it. No. <laughs> Probably sat right up high on the middle of the car. Can you imagine? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it would just be... Wheels probably that thick. Yeah. Wooden. <laughs> In fact, the first one that happened, the wheels probably rattled themselves to death. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, I actually was reading about something else too. And it was, it's funny because 
I don't know why I was reading about this. It must have just come up on the feed or something. It was talking torque converters. Yeah. And it was talking about people who are having some issues that they think might be a transmission issue. Yeah. When really, it's a torque converter issue. Happens a lot. So... And and of course, as I was reading that, it's saying, oh yeah, this is uh, endemic to Wranglers. And I'm going, well, there you go. <laughs> Look, I don't think you can say Wranglers in fairness. I thought Talk Converter is pretty much universal how it works. And yeah. it, it, it does kind of what it says. It's creating torque. I think people don't realize that what a torque converter is versus how it, how it fits in with the whole drivetrain. Well, basically, so on an automatic gearbox, it's, it's only relevant to an automatic gearbox and, mm. a, and a classic automatic gearbox, not something like a DSG or a PDK or, that you have like a, a dual clutch transmission nowadays. But on a manual transmission, you have an engine, rotates a flywheel on the end of it. The flywheel is only put there to allow that to contact the clutch. The clutch will then drive the tr transmission. Now, a torque converter kind of does the job of you're taking it so it uses fluid it okay. takes hydraulic fluid and and it takes that that rotation torque from the engine and converts that into uh, uh through the fluid coupling of the torque converter into oil pressure now on a trans automatic transmission you still have an oil pump mm. that uses this rotation to pump and supply pressure but it converts the torque into a usable form of energy for the automatic transmission. That's probably the easiest way to, to explain it. But torque converters require good oil mm -hmm. and the right amount of oil, the right kind of oil. And one of the problems for torque converters is they're very finely made, engineered. They have to be balanced perfectly. Mm. So some torque converters suffer with a judder. So yeah, you get the male exactly. judder. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes going between your you know, your, your four, five, six gears and the overdrive. Yeah, so, you... so you'll get one of the things we do to test it, which isn't ideal, but it's a quick 100 meter drive and you can figure it out. If you put load on the engine, an excessive amount of load on the engine, so people that tow might mm -hmm. notice it, but then when they've not got anything on the back, it's not as bad or it doesn't happen at all. Um, so to kind of replicate that, you can drive with a foot on the brake pedal. So left foot on the brake pedal and just hold it. And it's usually in the 1,500 to 2,500 RPM range, depending on where the torque band is on your right. vehicle. But if you get sort of in the low third of the rev range with your foot on the brake, you can, you can make it happen. And that 90% of the time is pretty accurate way of deciding, yeah, it's a torque on. And sometimes you just need to get, take them apart. Sometimes it just needs rebalancing and you repair them internally, you can repair them. And we can repair torque converters. We, you know, it's more expensive to remove the gearbox and the torque converter and put it back in terms of manpower and labor charge than it is to do the repair. The repair kits are sometimes seven or 800 dirhams. Okay. And the cost of a new one is thousands. Right. They're not cheap. It's not an easy to make thing. Mm. You know, trying to explain it in layman's terms is difficult enough. So trying to build one, you can't <laughs> imagine. So they are expensive. But one of the issues with torque converters is they hold probably, I mean, if you take an average size proper roast dinner plate, so you've got, you know, that's pretty much fair comparison in terms of width. Around dinner plate, full size dinner plate is about the size of a torque converter, but it's about anything from five to maybe 10 inches thick, depending on the application and transmission. And some of them are bigger diameters. Now that is effectively, essentially hollow. As I say, there are parts inside there for friction. There are, there are, there are things inside there, but effectively it's like a, a, a vestibule that holds oil. Mm. Now, when people change their transmission oil, they'll drain the oil out of the bottom of the transmission and they'll fill it up. So you drain mm. six liters out, it's a little bit low, so you'll put the, the, the drain uh, or oil change capacity might be seven, so you put the seven back in. There's probably two, two and a half liters in the torque converter still. Mm. So 20, 25% of your oil hasn't been changed and it's very, very difficult to get that out. Okay. So another thing that happens here with torque converters, um, which then go on to damage torque converter, but then also the transmission is when you have transmission oil coolers fail. Oh boy. So we talked about engine oil coolers. 
I've sent you a video of a nice oh. pink milkshake coming out of the bottom of a transmission. Yeah. Drain all that out and leave the plug off three weeks if you like, but the nothing is going to come out of the torque converter. The only way to get what's in the torque converter out is to take the torque converter out and tip it upside down and drain it out and then manually flush that. So fill it back up, swirl it round and tip it out again. People don't do that because it's another thousand dirhams, two thousand dirhams, depending on yeah. whose labor rate you're paying, to remove the gearbox and take the torque converter out. And if you're changing the transmission oil, so a transmission oil and filter change on, let's say, we just talked about my Tuareg. My Tuareg retail is probably going to be two, two and a half thousand dirhams to change the oil and filter on the transmission. It's labor, parts, and VAT. That's a lot of money. So are you going to pay another 1500 to remove the transmission in labor, drain the torque converter, and don't forget then you've got to pay for another two liters of transmission oil and put it back in. So then a two, two and a half becomes four, five thousand dirham bill. Nobody's doing no it. No one's even trying to sell it because you think, what are you talking about? Yeah. If you can't do it properly, I won't do it at all then, right? Yeah, exactly. So when you have an oil flush, because you've had a cooler fail, now on a transmission cooler more than on an engine cooler, the coolant will go into the oil because as soon as you switch off your engine, your transmission oil pressure is zero mm. straight away. And it's, it's a lot cooler than coolant as well. So the heat of the, the, the cooling system and the fact that it's under pressure means that the fluid goes into the oil. Free flow, yeah. So then you end up with torque converter full of contaminated oil and you never, ever, ever you can change the oil. I'd be willing to be proven wrong and I, I would pay for the oil to, to see it, but you could change the oil a hundred times and you will never get rid of that mix. Mm. No chance. You, you would spend 25, 30,000 dirhams on oil and filter changes and you'd still have the same problem. There's no way you can just blow it out so you can get it. No. The torque converter, so we, we, to back to the sort of visualization of what one is, there's a, there's a hole in the middle that fits into the transmission to allow right. oil in and out of it. Yeah. And that is the only way to drain it. Why would they put a drain into it? A little because thing, how do you balance that? You've oh, got threads okay. in yeah, so, you know, yeah. And there's very, very little clearance. It has to be as big as possible, again, in a finite space. So it's, it's yeah. and there are, it, we were imagining it as hollow to, to imagine the oil inside it, it isn't hollow. So you're drilling through the internal components of one. Um, I'm trying to think now, we might have we might have one in the garage it was off of an escalade which we'd repaired and then the customer towed a boat and got stuck on the slipway and completely destroyed everything on the transmission so we might have a torque converter which we're probably never going to use i might see about getting the engineering guys over the road to plasma cut it in half for us and uh, we can maybe put some pictures on there for mm. people to visualize it because it isn't a hollow mm. box, but it, 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 it effectively is in terms of its oil carrying capacity. So very difficult to, mm. to, to do. And, and they are, automatic transmissions are so often overlooked. And one of the reasons for that is, and I can say this as a fact from my days of being first in college out of school and learning about them it's so difficult to understand how an automatic works and especially being from the uk where nothing was automatic anyway who yeah. cares yeah i'm not going to see an automatic I'm yeah. not working on a bus i don't care so, so come here well yeah then you come here and everything's automatic yeah. now fortunately you know particularly where we lived in the uk there was a lot of our customer base was quite senior in mm. age mm. so a lot of them were automatic vehicles and we did a lot for motability which is a scheme for um, disabled people to use some of their disability benefits from the government towards a sure. car that yeah. we can then modify to allow them to drive with one arm or one leg yeah. or whatever it may be a lot of those are always by design automatic so we did have a lot of automatics in and we did get quite a good grounding on automatic transmissions but lots of people don't like them so because they don't want to work on them, they've never bothered learning about them properly. And it's so often easy to overlook simple things like, well, I've changed the oil, but it's still the same. You haven't changed the oil. Yeah. You know, you, you haven't changed the oil until you've removed the gearbox and taken the torque converter out. And, you know, you haven't. If it's as simple as 
you're changing the oil every 60,000 because the manufacturer says so. They're aware of what I've just said. Of course they are more detail than I could ever know. That's why the service range is there because they'll know, okay, as long as you keep it regularly changed and allow the mm. build up to be a minimum, then it'll be fine. And that, that is very invariably true. But there are some big, big companies out here, international companies out here, ZF, um, that make automatic transmissions, that have repair centers here that are full from door to door repairing people's transmissions. Nine out of 10 of those are because they've not been regularly serviced. So there we go. Make sure you're servicing these things regularly yeah. because it's going to cost you a fortune. I mean, the talk on, how a torque converter works is, is interesting. What it does is interesting, but it's very, very complex. And as I say, it, if I was to say to you, James, a couple of thousand dirhams to change your transmission on and fill it, you might think, well, you know what needs doing because they're repairing the transmission to 10K plus. I can, you know, keep on top of it. But if you haven't been doing it regularly, it's not going to be enough because yeah. it's in the torque converter. There's there's twenty five percent of your oil and more sometimes in the torque converter. So. Hmm. There we go. That's a that's a sobering thought right there. Yeah. What, what what have you got going on in the shop right now, by the way? All sorts of. <laughs> Aside from all the vehicles that you're waiting for. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all sorts of horrific. So we we had a call this morning from a uh, sort of a friendly garage that that we know a couple of the guys there and the owner of, and they've had a crafter in that they can't get the camshaft timing. Right on, so that's coming over. We've got a 1972 Land Cruiser that's come from the UK. Wow. Um, that's just been imported for, well, basically restoration. It's kind of clean cosmetically, but mechanically it's been left in the mm. water and the salt in the UK, so it's not great. Um, but it's, it's relatively straightforward work. The only issue being that the um, chassis number has been not, noted down wrong oh, by no. the British Oh, authority, no. Oh, no. which then wasn't picked up by the port authority that exported it, and it then wasn't picked up here when it was imported. So now we either have to go through the whole process again, but fortunately we found someone that talked sense at the RTA, um, which is who has said that if you can get it to the test centre, and then we'll fail it and it write down clearly that it's failed because the chassis number doesn't match. It's not one of the the... Uh, serial numbers at the end, it's one of the first numbers. So instead of F, sorry, instead of uh, FJ or whatever it is, it's F5. And the J has been noted down as a five for some reason. So if we can work that out with them, then they said the port should issue as a new VCC with the right paperwork. Otherwise it's a six month task and another 10,000 dirhams to get that rectified. Yeah, what's that? So, well, no, because then you're talking summer and who's going to buy a 72 vehicle in the summer? Yeah. In interesting, isn't it? How you know a mistake and someone just sort of like, yeah, that's the right, that's the right, that's the right. Like, yeah, yeah, it's not right. It wouldn't have happened with a modern car because no. people are used to seeing the chassis numbers and this, so that's not the right letter there. Yeah. But had that um, employee that noted that down initially wrong in the UK, maybe worked for Toyota thirty years ago or whatever, they would have said that's not right. Yeah. But they, they didn't. Yeah. They, it's just, a, again, we just said human error. It's not Eventually it gets, got caught, but like, boy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's got caught by the customer, though. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah, the person that's that not made any of the mistakes has now got the, the hassle. So we're actually taking that for test today. Hopefully, when I get back to our coups, that's been gone. And we've got a failure sheet that mentions that. So we can go back to the guys that manage the import for us and, and get them to reissue the papers. Mm. Fingers crossed. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, it's pretty pretty standard. January is a quiet month. Oil changes, and tire changes. Yeah, I mean, most people put off anything that's not breakdown maintenance in yeah. January. Cause it's credit card bills, school fees. Yeah. Now's the time to start getting the air, air conditioning checked out. Make sure your window motors. Yeah, are that that'll be next month, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Yeah, it'll start to not be sixteen degrees in the morning anymore, and people will start I, to put the AC I, back on. I was jogging this morning. And it was a warm wind. And yeah. I'm going, what, we had one, two weeks of winter? Yeah. Like it was, you know, I'm, I'm wearing just a, a t-shirt and it was warm wind. Yeah. And this is at five in the morning. Yeah. And I'm going, how is this possible? Hopefully going, it stays cold for a little while longer. I, I, I think we're on the upswing. I hate to say it. I really think we're on the upswing and it's sad. Yeah, well, all, the, all, the, all that means to us is, like I say, AC work and overheating. 
But, yeah. Uh, January is always quiet. It's, it's oh. relatively quiet. You know, it's, it's holidays and people paying for that and people traveling for the whole holidays in December. So there's, there's, if the car starts and gets to where you need to go, people well, don't happy. worry about it. Yeah. But then you get back to the whole breakdown means. We, we were talking actually with, with Pete and Chino from Borgen Beck and we were in a meeting with somebody that we're, that are looking to buy our parts and we, we mentioned spark plugs because Borgen Beck don't supply spark plugs. Hmm. And it's one of the biggest, I would say, errors workshops make here in not selling spark plugs. At, at least 50% of the um, electronic ignition coil, and I'm talking about the direct coils that are on the top of the spark plug, one yeah. per cylinder, at least 50%, probably more of those that we change are down to the fact that the spark plugs have failed and they're just overloading that coil. And they're not cheap, yeah. but spark plugs for some reason here, you know, they're seen often because they're not explained by the service advisor or, the, or whoever it is that's talking to the customer, that they need to be kept. You know, this is preventative maintenance, not yeah. breakdown maintenance, because breakdown is very, very detrimental to the rest of the engine and the exhaust system, which are expensive to repair. They're just seen as upsell. And people are like, well, my car's not misfiring, it starts okay, I'm not worried about it, lack of power, petrol's cheap, so I don't want to save any mileage, so. Cali Wally, as they say, we'll leave yeah. them in there. You know, it's like, yeah. and and it's so detrimental to the long term, even short term, sometimes a medium term ownership of those vehicles. That, you know, not only is the 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 staff being detrimental to the business, but they're also being hugely, hugely detrimental to the life of that vehicle, and mm. therefore the owner of it. It's you know, it's it's negligent really. And spark plugs just aren't sold often enough and it would save massive amounts of fuel and pollution. It would save massive amounts of waste in terms of coil mm -hmm. uh, changes. You know, as a garage, it probably sounds better to wait for the coils to fail and put 2,000 dirhams worth of coils on than it does to change 400 dirhams worth of spark plugs. But yeah. it's the wrong way to look at it, in my opinion. So Crazy. Yeah, so spark plugs is, is one that really is, is a problem here and I, I, I think that that's something we're going to concentrate on this year in terms of having physical, whether it's videos and pictures or just parts and 10 minutes and a bit of a leaflet to explain to customers what we're reporting and why, because it's very difficult sometimes to get all the information across when your phone's ringing or there's other people yeah. waiting in a queue. So we really need to start explaining to people why we're doing what we're doing and, and what the benefits of that are. Because if, if you can't justify what you're charging somebody, then you know, they're going to walk. Yeah. Mm. Hey, Glenn, this was a lot of fun. I, I really had a, a, you know, a good time talking cars again today, as always. Yeah. And you know, PowerWorks Automotive keeps us rolling. That's what, what is your slogan? You got a slogan? Power works. Power works. There. <laughs> <laughs> Everything you wanted to know about your automobile, but we're afraid to ask, that's what you get on this podcast. And we'll do it all again really, really soon. Glad to talk to you.